Hey, hey, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of The Amazon Files, brought to you by Mommy Income. I am Amy Fearman. Kristen is off this week, and I will be bringing on a guest to join me. This week's guest is a longtime Mommy Incomer and bundle seller. Debbie Joyce has been on the podcast previously in episode 63. And Debbie is the queen of bundle variations. She takes what she knows and turns it into big profits without reinventing the wheel. Her story will help inspire you to work smarter and not harder in your Amazon business. Now, before I bring Debbie on to chat with me, please make sure that if you have questions or are interested in selling on Amazon, that you join our Facebook community. You can head over to mommyincome.com slash join us with the code word Debbie's story, Debbie's story, to be to gain access to the community to be able to ask those questions. Now, without further ado, Debbie, come on and join me. All right, Debbie, welcome to the Amazon Files. We are so glad to have you back on the Amazon Files. Debbie was episode 63, What Wholesale Bundles Can Do For You, if you want to go back and listen to her previous episode. But for those of you who don't know Debbie, Debbie, can you give us a little bit of insight into your journey to Amazon and to Wholesale Bundles? Well, I started back, um, I had a, a gift store and a gift basket store, um, and we ended up closing it and I ended up with a lot of inventory left over. So we started um, on eBay selling off all of the equipment and that was actually working pretty good. And I actually started selling some of my inventory, but um, then FBA was coming up when I was doing all these videos on eBay, you know, everybody was talking about FBA. So I said, well, I'm just gonna switch them over and sell all my new stuff over on, onto FBA. Well, it's, it's sold. You know, and then I already had my wholesalers from the from the from the store, so I just kept ordering and ordering and ordering, and pretty soon I've got an Amazon business. <laughs> Oops, so I fell it, into that. Yeah, so that's kind of how that that ended up. So we've been doing it now for this is our fourth um, ten ninety nine. The first one was only we really started at Q four or in the summertime, right before Q4. So the first one really, other than, I think Q4, by selling in Q4, or starting in Q4, you just, you know, you can't believe it. Things are selling like they're selling. So that kind of helped us. If we would have started in January, we probably wouldn't have ever continued, you know, but since we started in, in Q4, we just kept selling and selling and selling. And so, and then the next year, I went to your workshop. We were the, I was in the very first one in Atlanta and the walkthrough and stuff. And that was in January. And we had just come out of our second Q4 and doing really good. And after what I learned in the workshop, we just kept, the Q4 just kept going. <laughs> we just kept Q4 going. Q4 just kept going. going. Yeah. I love to hear um, that. Now, when you say we, who is we? Me and my husband. And now but I know in the face. I say we, but it's it's me, and he's he's gotten a lot in, more involved over the last year in helping me prep and stuff. I was going to say you have turned him into your own personal prep center, is my he's understanding. My prep center, I have to, he and he keeps me going because he gets up in the morning and says, "What are we prepping today?" And then I got to go. Oh, then I have to go to the computer and look and see what I need to restock and get him started. So he really keeps me going. So That's awesome. It's that accountability piece. Like, I'm ready to work for you. What do you want me to do? That's right. an amazing, amazing piece to have. Now, so you came into Amazon already doing wholesale. So you had that piece, which is an amazing place to start. You never had to do RA or OA or any of that type of stuff. No. Now... So you've kind of explained what made the, so we the workshop was that the first bundling that you did was after the workshop did you do any bundling prior to the workshop I did but I didn't realize I was doing it I think um, until I fell into your your um, podcasts and your your videos because I had come from the gift basket background in the store I think I was already kind of doing bundles because you were I was putting themes together 
you know, in gift baskets and, and selling it that way. So it kind of came natural to me as far as that goes. And then, of course, I didn't like to share the buy box. So, you know, and I was never into this race to the bottom. I didn't like that. I didn't like, you know, going on somebody else. And then all of a sudden you were, you know, you weren't selling anything or you're up against Amazon or, or something, you know. So I, I, that's what I do for bundle. Yep. It, it keeps you away from all of the stuff that you hear as far as the race to the bottom and all of that stuff, the competition. So going into bundles and talking specifically about your beginning journey into bundles. Now you seem to be doing it a little bit, but what were the pieces of research going into that that you struggled with when starting bundling? What were the, what, what did the workshop help you realize going from, I'm kind of doing this, but not realizing it to making it into something you did as all you do in your business now? Um, I think I've changed a little bit over the years. I, I, I do my research a lot different. I do use the framework process. It's, it does, see, it's what I was doing anyways. It just kind of puts it in words for me. Um, I do usually um, have an idea through my catalogs or through what I'm doing, um, what the next bundle is going to be. So I'm not one that goes and just looks at Amazon and sees, unless I'm in my, my niche and finding out, you know, well, somebody's selling this, maybe this is a good idea. And then I'll go back and research through that. Um, so I think I'm, I'm using the framework. And as far as what I didn't like what I started doing in the beginning was it's that second piece and everybody says that I don't know I you know you say okay well you know this coffee mug's doing really really good but what do I put with it you know I can't put a you know what do you yeah I just don't know what to put with it and so then I was looking at the second piece and I'm you know you start looking at liquidators and little teeny pieces and stuff to go with it instead of something that's almost equal to it you know, that's what I kind of do now is I kind of look at when you compliment something, you're not really putting a, a teensy little something, you know, a, a, a cup and a straw to get, I, that's, you know, you're putting maybe a pack of straws with a set of cups or something, you know, that type of thing. So it's yeah. looking at the value that you're providing to the buyer more so than what's the cheapest way I can bring this product to the market for something that's already selling. And it's, it's really understanding that buyer really understanding that what you're doing with bundles is not about what is easy for you. It's what is going to sell because it's what the buyer, the problem you're solving for the buyer. Um, and that, so yeah, let's bring, here's that's your Dixie pretty- cup and your straw. <laughs> <laughs> right. And a good example of that is what I'm kind of what I'm working on right now is that um, I take what um, you kind of say about as far as taking your 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 product or your but your variation or whatever like that and seeing what else you can do with it. Um, for instance, like if my, ver- my if my product is yellow and it's a kitchen item for a yellow thing, well, then now I'm looking at who buys yellow kitchen stuff, you know? So you're looking at, um, you know, some people do sunflowers, some people do lemons, some people do pineapples, some people, you know, I mean, that's how they're whatever. And it was, it was kind of interesting. In one of my other groups, somebody asked if there was any um, place or anybody knew any place that um, sells bananas. And it's like, I never thought about people doing bananas, you know, and that's one of those things that you look at Google trends and stuff like that. And you say, well, pineapples were big last year. Why not bananas? You know, and and that's one of the things that I'm researching. And I was surprised that there's 6,000 searches a month for banana yellow. I don't know if it's a kitchen. Banana yellow. It makes me think of minions whenever I think of bananas from the minion movies. And maybe that's something you add into your banana kitchen thing or something, or maybe that's what they're going for. But um, that's pretty much how I research it. What's interesting is going and thinking about the research and not thinking about what you like or don't like, but looking at what the trends are telling you and going, basing your research based on, well, somebody else here mentioned bananas and where can I find bananas? What is the research telling me about bananas? I 
I don't remember what, who I was talking to, but flamingos. Now, I always think of flamingos as yard decor or bathroom decor, but then all of a sudden there's flamingo kitchen decor. And I was like, wait, who puts flamingos in their kitchen? Right. I would never, ever think of that. And tropical and Hawaiian, and you think of all these other keywords that go with it, yes. Right, and so it's amazing to me to see how we all have our own biases, and I think that that's one of those struggle points that people have when they're bundling is you get you hit this wall of like, I, I wouldn't do that, so why would somebody else want that? Well, right. oftentimes there's a reason it's being manufactured, right? Somebody's done some research somewhere and being able to bring it to the market for them. Oh, love it. Now, you've already mentioned like four times in this couple of minutes we've been talking that variations are your thing. You love doing variations. So tell us more about your journey into variations and what that does for your business. Oh, variation. From the very beginning, when I started with variations, um, it was, I well, this year, this year has been a whole lot different for us because last last January I made a New Year's resolution that all that our business was going to be quality and not quantity. So we cut, I mean, we went into and we looked at every single thing that we were doing and the price and who was selling it and what was selling it. We applied for our trademark. We got our trademark. You know, we started now with our, our brand and everything. And it was amazing because I made the decision that if I was going to do it and we, lo- and we didn't make money last year, then that was okay. You know, we didn't really need it. It wasn't something that we really needed to depend on. But as it was, we ended up doing less and making more. That's amazing. That's called working smarter, not harder definition of it guys listen to what debbie just said we decided to cut back and focus on these things and you ended up doing better by spending less time doing it right and so with the variations that we do um people buy you know they go into the they go into the listing and they see you know they're looking they find a listing that they like and let's say they see the red one and that's the what they wanted and then all of a sudden they look in there and they go oh they got a teal one that's kind of cute too and then pretty soon they've bought in three different things from you all from the same listing so that's what we really like and um we're also doing multi-packs of some of the stuff that's in our variations because we find that people that buy a variation of a certain pattern or a certain whatever also bought this. And so we're putting in, maybe they wanted one piece of that, but they wanted a few of them, but they didn't want all the other stuff. And that's interesting because sometimes people want that extra thing and if you can, if you see that being consistent or we've had people contact, I've had people contact me, can you sell this piece by itself? Right. I want to buy just this. And I'm like, no, but I can. <laughs> and, and, that's- we have, and we have quite a few listings that we are also the, um, the person that has the listing that people that bought this also bought this. And we are the second listing on there also. So, you know, that that's good too. It's really nice when they are buying multiple things from you. It's like, yes, they want it. And if you make it easy, if you are putting variations together where they can easily do that or they automatically come up as frequently bought together, um, we've done tests with that on ours. And it's it helps when yours is that first, second, sometimes third. It's like, oh, they want this. Have you, have you I'll ask you this question because we've done it, is when you see them frequently buying those together, do you deluxify it as Kristen would say and make a bigger pack yes well um it depends we, make, we might make a different pack because we do okay. variations of variations so we might do a different pack we may t- take our our one variation and add in some extra of the one or you know and charge a little bit more and stuff like that and then it becomes a whole nother listing so yeah we do that too we do you know, and it just it just depends on the um, the season and what we're doing. Because we take we also take our variations and make them for, so that they're better for the season. 
So like, for instance, if we're selling a variation that's got red and white in it, we might add something that's blue for, you know, and do it for the 4th of July. We might add something that is green and add it, you know, for uh, Christmas. We might do, we look at sports teams. We look at college colors. We look at all kinds of stuff, depending on what our variation is and what our product is. So talk to me about variations and research when it comes to, because basically what you're doing, you're saying we're taking this research that we've already done and applying it across the same thing, but looking at these different things while doing it. Talk to me about how that saves you time as in your research process. It's not only that it's the variation, it might just be the keyword. You know what I mean? It might be a product that, you know, if you're doing banana yellow, you know, you might add into your keyword or into your back end or something that says um, perfect for yellow decorated dorm rooms or something, you know, I don't know, but something to that effect. So it might just be into your, your keyword to do that. But we have different, pro- we have pretty much a one, well, maybe two niche um, areas that we're in. So it, 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 um, it just depends on what the product is and where you're trying to go with it. But we, we take it to every level that we can possibly think of the, what the customer might be doing. Like I said, nobody's thinking about putting bananas in their kitchen right now. We didn't think they were, you know. Right, until all of a sudden you're like, oh, there's a new trend. I know that Google Trends is one of those places where I have found things, but like, I didn't know that was a thing. Um, it's one of, the, that and Pinterest have been two of the greatest resources and for Etsy. me. As far as Etsy is really good too. We do Etsy. We look at Etsy a lot. Ooh, because Etsy, that's... Yeah, because they're doing homemade stuff or they're doing things like that that are selling and you can pretty much see by their, um, their ratings, you know, how many ratings they have on whether or not people are buying from them. And you can kind of see what the trends are there too. So. That's another interesting source. That's a great idea. So you have, you're talking about two niches. And so over the past couple of years, you've built a foundation of knowledge on in those niches. And instead of reinventing the wheel and going to find something else to do, in a new year, you are doubling down and saying, what else can we do in this exact same thing? So you are, in essence, building on your knowledge bank. Right. And it is. It keeps going back to my knowledge bank through two different um, occupations that I had. So, yeah. And every time I try, I go, oh, that's kind of cool. I want to do that. And then as soon as I start that, it's like, no, pull yourself back because you end up just not knowing what to do with it after you order it, and then you end up just trying to get rid of it. So, yeah. So speaking of that, you know, going to that, go, trying to say, oh, I'm going to try something new because you feel like you should try something new, but sometimes it just makes sense to continue doing what works. And we actually recorded a podcast recently talking, Chris and I did about this, where instead of reinventing the wheel and trying to go find more and more wholesalers, looking at the catalogs that you already have and talking to your reps. Now being in the niches that you're in, how many approximately vendors do you work with on a regular basis? Um, probably about four. I only think that four is really what I'm dealing with. Right. I mean, I have other wholesale accounts that I'm afraid they're going to close me probably, you know what I mean? But I don't really, um, I look at them sometimes for ideas and stuff, but I really, you know, only when their catalog comes or something to that effect, but really only four we're looking at right now, but I'm always on Google looking for a pattern or looking for something in my, in our niches, just to see if there's something out there that's, that's different. It's Um, always looking for new, but really looking at the vendors you have, there's two reasons, right? One, you know, the product line, you know, the lead time, you know, all those parts and pieces. It makes that part of the business operate easier. You also can get better discounts when you're ordering more product from the same vendors. Guys, this is proof that you can be successful bundling on Amazon without 85 different wholesalers. Don't need 85 different wholesalers. You just need a handful of them. I have six, I think. Yeah. 
Um, and I have one or two that I buy little pieces from that fit here that I couldn't find from any of my other ones, but mostly I have six that I order from. That's it. Right. And then everything else is, I build off of that. And I think that we, when we get stuck, instead of going back to what we know, we try and say, that's not working. I'm going to go completely over here and try something else. And that doesn't always work well. Right. I agree. I agree. I agree. All right. Um, so, yes, go ahead. So back on the research, another thing that I do is I, oh. as I look at, um, I, my, I work my accounts. I really work my accounts and I look at all of my um, reviews that I'm getting and um, what they're telling me and all my competitors reviews and what's telling them. So um, on one of my, my bundles, um, for instance, I had a bunch of reviews that were saying that um, I bought this and my husband loved it or I bought this for my boyfriend and you know, it was the perfect gift and all this other stuff. And so I did one thing by putting in the back end, I put male, masculine, all those, those into my keywords in the back end. And I don't think it was two weeks and I got the, the um, Amazon choice for um, that product for men. You know, because she paid attention to what her customers were saying. Were saying yes, and it wasn't the packaging or or something like that. If you if you really pay attention to what they're saying, you know, it, it really pays off. It gives you the keywords to add. Oftentimes, we think we have to think all of this up and figure it out to put it in. The the buyers are telling you what keywords, and especially if you're looking back at your listings and seeing what people are saying to be able to look at those keywords and pull those out to be able to put those into your listing because it may not be when you created that listing, you didn't have any of that in there. You didn't necessarily think that that one was going to be just for guys, but right. all of a sudden this is being bought for men all the time. Okay. Let's make it so that it can be easily found for people searching for gifts for men. Yeah. The same way with looking at your competitors too. If you look at, even if you look at theirs and if they're having a lot of packaging problems or, or something like that, and it's pretty similar to yours, you kind of know what, um, you know, how to do yours so that it's better, you know? Yeah. I know that one of the things that I've seen done is you'll see people referring to how it's packaged so that the person buying it, maybe it's a bullet point, maybe it's in the description that they know that this is going to get to them and it's going to have survived the shipping to get yeah. to them. Um, there have been times where I've purchased products and I'd be like, why? This is crushed. Why would you even put it in a box like that? It could, it's not going to stand up to anything. It's really annoying when Amazon takes a box and just sticks it in a poly mailer. And you're like, that was never going to survive in a poly mailer. But Amazon doesn't always think about the item before they put it in a box so you or, or in a poly bag or just slaps a label on the front of it. I've had that happen too in Q4. And so always thinking about all of the things that could potentially happen to your box so you're making sure that however it gets shipped, it's still going to survive and be the best that it can be when it gets to the buyer. Right. But paying attention to your customers is a huge piece of research that I think a lot of people miss because they do the front end and then don't come back to it. Remember guys, this isn't a set it and forget it business. We want to make sure that we're constantly paying attention. Right. Yeah. And, and, same thing with my account. I mean, just working the accounts, you know, you see something, even, even if it's um, selling really good, all of a sudden you've, you've been concentrating on this other area and you go back just to check something and you say, well, I could have done those pictures better or I could have done that. And even though they're selling very good, you can, you can always improve. You can always improve. We tend to think, oh, this is good. It's selling good. I don't need to do anything about it. But what if you tweak things? For example, the adding the male gift one, if that was already selling well and you made this right. shift and bam, it took off even more. We tend to think, oh, it's selling well. I don't need to worry about it. But what if it could sell even better than it already exactly. is? It does, yes. How many SKUs do you currently carry? Um, I probably, well, okay, let's say I carry, I have a folder that I keep on each one of my listings mm -hmm. you know and then i i'm always looking at the profit and whether or not amazon changes something or uh, <laughs> they're yeah, always doing that they're always doing that or they're you know the same thing is if they're tweaking my um 
my size or something, you know, sometimes they do that and all of a sudden your profit's gone, you know, or whether or not I can do better on the, on the size to make the profit. But I have currently, I have about, I want to say about 28 products. And then I probably have about maybe a hundred SKUs. So, because so of all look the at that, guys. 28 individual products, but variations on all of those. Right. So they're either multi-packs or they're, or they're um, variations on those 28 pack, 28. And then there's a couple seasonal in there. You know, I throw in a, I have a couple, I have two dollar store things that I sell. Uh, it's a bundle, but I sell them twice a year. And I only sell them because nobody else has ever jumped on my listing. <laughs> and, and you so keep I, doing it. And they I keep just, successful. It just, you know, makes me a couple hundred dollars for that month and I move on, you know, and I look and nobody's on that listing again. So I just order, you know, through dollarstore.com and send them in and they sell and move on. You know? <laughs> those are nice. I like those seasonal replens <laughs> because they, if you can have those from year to year to year and they keep selling, they're great. I'll make a couple hundred bucks. Like you said, like right. that it's the repetition and having those replens makes it that much easier. So you're not having to think about it. You're like, this is going to make me money this month. Okay. Some gets invested there and then still work on. And you can't things. believe nobody's ever jumped on the listing. That's, I'm always amazed. That's what it is. You know, you just keep selling them and nobody's ever jumped on the listing. So maybe somebody hasn't done that same research. Who knows? Um, yeah. it, it's interesting to see how people don't find things and the ones that people find you're like, how did you find that I do that? Yeah. But it is what it is. But now brand registry is definitely a direction. And what, as far as doing bundles now that you have brand registry as far as dealing with competition and all that stuff. What is, how has that changed how you do things? Um, I, well, I'm, I'm still fairly new with it. So it's, um, I ran into a few problems um, because my, all of, most of my um, variations that I'm doing now, they're already established. And right. nobody's really jumping on them because I do have, um, you know, some, some protection in there with, with some, you know, my, my brand and stuff like that. But before I got brand registered under my trademark, I was just using an acronym of the trademark. Gotcha. And I was using my old SKUs or my old UPC codes. UPCs. And the problem I was having is they won't transfer those over with the UPC code under that correct oh did i lose you debbie did i lose you i'm still here oh there you are you froze for a minute <laughs> there you go she's back <laughs> um, Happens sometimes. so they have so many reviews on them and they're doing so well that i just leave them so anything, same way. anything new that I'm getting is automatically gone over to my, my brand registry. And, um, you know, I'm looking forward to the um, packaging training. Uh, training that we're doing in the hub. And um, I do a little bit of packaging, not a whole lot. I have never been asked for packaging. Even when I applied for brand registering, they asked me if I had it. I said yes, but they never asked me to show it. So I've never been asked or anything right now. We do do a little bit, you know, we use um, like, we'll use like, we have like the um, white boxes, like the, the literature boxes or whatever, the little pizza boxes like, and we use those a lot and we use um, a, a tape on them or something with our brand on it, you know, something like that. And actually I found that if people return those, Amazon doesn't put them back on the shelf because your tape's been Right. It's been and it's actually a positive thing if you think about yeah. it. For those of us who have bundles that you don't want Amazon to put back on the shelf, if you're putting it in something where they have to break the seal, Amazon's gonna automatically put that as customer damage. They're not going to put it back on the shelf. Exactly. So if you want to have your pro product come back to you and not go back out, there's a way to deal with that because they're breaking that seal. Yes, because now let me speak to the brand registry and the changes we've seen in the past two months. Brand registry, 
branded packaging, Amazon's making some major shifts in that department. Um, and so what we were able to do before and what we can do now are going to be two different things. So those of you who don't have brand registry yet and are trying or are doing GTAN exemption, brand packaging is going to be an essential part of getting approval for those. So just know that. Um, going forward that understanding branded packaging is going to be an essential part of successful selling on Amazon, especially in the bundle space. So keep that in mind. Um, now I can't wait to do branded packaging. Yeah. So I, 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 I come from a background where I used to do branded packaging for customers. So it's part of my knowledge bank. Now talk to us in your research process in your business process. What are some of your favorite tools and softwares that you use that you can't imagine not to running your business without? Um, probably Helium 10 is my, is my go-to um, anymore. I have a couple other ones, but um, yeah, no, Helium 10 does it all. And it's, it, it's, it's great. Um, any other tools? Okay. So besides the Amazon, Amazon is the best tool you can may have, you know, and Google. Um, I'm using, um, shoot, what are the, I can't even think of the name of it. I'm, so I'm using a, a, a picture one right now mm -hmm. that is, um, God, what is the name of it? Can't think of it. We can put it in the show notes. Don't worry I don't it. know what it is. But anyways, it's basically where you can go in there and that you can do your um, your marketing type pictures. So they give you basically a background or like, and then you can put your, you can put people in it and you can put all this other stuff in it. Oh, wow. That's really cool. Holding your, holding your package or holding your product or sitting on a counter or however you want to want to do it. So, um, giving yeah, your no. lifestyle images so that you yeah. don't have to think about how am I going to show this in use? It gives you a way to be able to do that. That's, that's an amazing thing. Um, to be able to have that because oftentimes we have products, but we're not sure how to show people what they do because that's one of the important pieces is you can show somebody something, but if they don't know how it functions and how it works, they're going to skip over it and go to something else. And having those lifestyle images are, are not it's essential, called, but they it's help. It's called Glorify. 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 And it's got the clipping magic part of it in there if you want to, you know, you take out the, uh, the background. background. And it, everything, so it's called glorified. But it's it's uh, it's been really good. I mean, you've been I've been playing with it enough to sometimes some of my pictures look. I have to slow down <laughs> because it's just a measurement, you know. And I've got the measurement, you know, on a person and showing them holding it and this and that. And then you get the background and it gets kind of fun. But you know. <laughs> it gets fun, but it can be a time waster if you go too far with it. Right. Right. But that's, that's, that's a good tool to know about glorified. That's not one that I'm familiar with, but that's definitely depending on, especially the size piece, because how often have you gotten, I know that I have in the past gotten reviews that say this wasn't the size I thought it was going to be. We have to remember that our buyers don't always read and they, or they don't always understand what eight inches is. Yeah. But what, eight inches they think is big and eight inches actually isn't that big. But, but to have it, have it next to a person versus yeah. having a, uh, a nickel next to it or, you know, something like that. The, the eBay and variation of how to do size, yeah, right? One of those type of things for the size. It's, it's a, it's a nice tool to have on yeah, there. Sure. Um, I do use merchant words, um, too. Um, not as much because I do like helium 10 a whole lot better. Um, but I do have the paid version of that and I do like that. Um, uh, do you use inventory lab? I do use inventory. I do. I don't use it for my shipping. Okay. But I do use it for my reports and keeping track of stuff and, and whatever. So um, I just kind of have a, a way of doing my packing and my shipping. So it's easy for me, especially with my husband prepping, you know, I automatically <laughs> just go get him the tickets and everything else. And he, you know, we put it in the box and we do use the placement service, you know, the warehouse placement service or case packs when we're sending in. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention was, is I am, I, I really think people should listen to Amazon. You know, we get a lot of people that say, well, I haven't sold any and Amazon's telling me to send in 20. 
you know, well, there's a reason for it. And I, I really think that I started sending in a whole lot more than I used to only mm-hmm. because I read an article that said that there was so many warehouses and that if you had something on the East coast and you only sent in six, that it wasn't even being shown on in oh, Oregon yeah. or something to that effect. So I send in whatever Amazon recommends me sending in. And it seems like I really picked up in my volume of, of, you know, and I look at how I look at it is if I send in 20 and it doesn't sell they're quarters, you know, that's only a quarter now to have it sent back to me. So, you know, the chances it's, of it's it. worth the try, see what happens. If it increases, great. If it but that's interesting. We're starting to see the positioning of where things are being really important. When you send in six, now six for a test is one thing, but if you're only sending in a small amount, it's, it's hard. It's Amazon's like, we don't want to show it to people. Because we can't get it there in two days or less. They're really on that buyer experience. And if they can't make that buyer experience happen, they're not going to put it up. Amazon's got all that back end stuff figured out so that their buyers have the best experience. But it also and- might be that you're, you're not realizing that uh, this is back to working your listing again. So if Amazon now is telling you send six in and they're telling you, you know, to send 12 more in, you know, why? And you haven't even sold any. Well, you could start looking at it and you can find out that you're actually, you know, your um, your click rates or whatever are going through, but nobody's buying. So they know that there's eyes on it. It's just, you know, and then they want you to send more in, but you might need to look at your listing to see why it's not why actually it's not selling. selling. Because yeah. to me, they're telling you that it, that, People are looking at it, you know. It's Im- Yeah, it's important to see those eyeballs on it. And that's you can do that in your reports in Amazon to see there's eyeballs. Why aren't people buying? And you want to go. And it could be that, heck, your bullet points disappeared like we just had last week. Anything is possible mm-hmm. like that. So going in and paying attention to your listings, this is why I steer on the edge of having less listings and being able to pay more attention to them. One of the things that switching from RA to wholesale to wholesale bundles allowed that to happen because I didn't have to have 400 to be successful at selling. I can have 50 to 60 and be successful at selling those because and spend more time on each one to make sure that they're selling the best that they can. Um, and so that's, that's good insight. And thank you for sharing that because I think that people get scared. Well, I haven't sold any. So why am I going to spend money to send more in if it's not going to sell? Honestly, 25 cents to come back. They actually just changed that. So, um, it, it is inexpensive to ship it back if you need to. Now don't send in 5,000 units because 25 cents at 5,000 units is a whole lot of money, but being able to pay attention to what Amazon's saying because, and, and test it out, test it out on your bundles that are doing well. If Amazon sends, it said, send 50 of them. Test out what's the worst that can happen. You have to pull a bunch back, see what happens. Now, um, I think it's Valentine's Day, and you sold a bunch at Valentine's Day, and now it's the day after, and they're telling you to send in 50 more. Yeah, no. <laughs> that, that's be <laughs> smart reason, in what we do and what we're talking about, but yeah. Yeah, there's a reason. I, you know, it's all automatic, it's all robots out there doing, you know, the yep. thinking. So you need to, and they think differently than we do. Um, Robots can see things that humans don't always notice. And so paying attention to that, they're going to look at things and say, try do put this out there. And I know that a lot of people are like, why are they telling me to do this? Well, maybe they have knowledge that you don't have. Right. So there's that. So over the past year, what has been your, the biggest area of growth in your business? Is it sales? Is it margin? Is it more free time for you? Like what is your biggest area of growth that you've experienced? Um, probably sales. My margins pretty much stay, stay the same. I, I, I get a certain margin. We do look at things that are selling, you know, and stuff. We, we had a product that we thought was selling really good. And then we looked at um, one of the other things that Helium 10 has is the profitability um, thing on each product. So you can go in there and see with your shipping and everything else, what is your bottom, you know, and we found out we were making like a dollar and a half profit. And you're like, not worth it. And less, and less than that on in Q4, you know, so it was like, why are we spending all this time on this product? So we pretty much just let it, you know, 
to fizzle. Flee. Yeah, and we didn't we didn't send it back in. So we, we look at our profits all the time and see what our margins are and if it's something we it's not you know don't fall in love with your products. You yes, know? Do not marry your inventory. Like gonna What's go interesting at one point. I, I want to go back to what you just said and, and tie it back into what you said earlier. Remember, guys, she has changed the way she does business over the past year to do less and is making more. Like she's, your hourly rate has gone up in the past year. And so that being able to do that by reducing what you're doing and still have your sales go up, oftentimes it's hard to let go of those ones. Well, they're still selling. Okay, are they selling enough to make it worth continuing to have them? Oftentimes it's not. I got rid of a bunch of bundles late last year because was I selling significant? Yeah, but did it make sense or did it make more sense to do these other things that were selling even better and investing the inventory there? If you have bundles that are selling really well and you don't have enough cash flow to invest in more, look at the ones that aren't selling as well and make the decision as to do I get rid of these ones that aren't selling as well, just not replenish them and put that those dollars towards the ones that are already selling well and keep pushing those forward. So all of those things. Um, yeah, our business plan's a little bit different because we don't, um, we were looking at a prep center, but now it's, now we don't need to. Um, with the few that we have, if we want to go somewhere for the weekend or whatever like that, we just make sure we've sent all our stuff in. We just a little bit of plan ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Um, we really don't use VAs anymore because I've got tools that kind of tell me most of that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, we're not going to be, you know, we're both retired and we're not going to be the type of people that have warehouses and order from China and do personal, whatever, you know, I've done some of that and I'm not, you know, I'm not going to have pallets come into my house. So, um, yeah. So, so I think what we're doing is, is workable for the average person. We're making a good living, that good living on it. And that's another thing too, is pay yourself. You've got to pay yourself. Just, you know, we made um, about almost a hundred thousand dollars more last year than we did the year before. And um, we actually, I mean, we made more money, but we probably could have made the same amount of money the year before, you know, because you can spend it so fast and send it in. And, you know, Amazon's the one that's making the money, not you. So you got to make, you've got to pay yourself first. Pay yourself first. Important. Yeah. We always look at it. You know, do we get a raise this month? No. Do we get a raise? You know, when do we get a raise? And, you know, you start looking at how much cash you've got left and, whether you get a piece of it, you know, and we've, and we've, you should always get a piece of it. It's it. Nobody wants to work for $0 no. and that's, it's, it's hard to put in the work when nothing's coming back to you. Exactly. If you're constantly doing all this work, all this output and you, nothing's coming back for that's, that's really hard to keep the motivation. Make. And what else you can, what else you can put on the business? You know, yep. we have so many utilities now that they pay for and, and, you know, for, what we do. So, you know, we're making money. That's, that's it. But we probably would have made the same amount of money, you know, year after year after year, if we weren't taking it out, you know, so. Yep. And, and that's one of those things that I think we forget that we should have that piece coming out and the piece that you're saying, do we get a raise this month? I right. think people just, I pay myself a flat fee every month and everything else goes back in the business. But as your business grows, if you're still paying yourself $500 when you have tripled your sales, uh, we need to reevaluate that, exactly. right? So always paying attention to how your business is doing. Also, it goes, it goes both directions though, right? If you're having a slow month, you have to look at it and evaluate that as well. So you're looking at it from both directions. It's why paying attention to your profit, paying attention to your ASINs to know, are they actually making me money? all those parts and pieces. It's not just send product in and forget about it. It's constantly paying attention. This is a business and you are treating it like that and doing an amazing job because you are using the tools at your disposal to understand your business. Okay. So you've been doing bundles for a long time. What is something that you would tell somebody, a piece of advice you could tell somebody who is just getting started with bundles? Um, probably quality. 
you know, look at you look at your quality, look at your knowledge bank and what you need, what you know. Um, you know, do your research bef before you do it. Just don't jump into something. I have jumped into something and gotten all the components and then it just didn't look right or the packaging didn't look right or something didn't fit together or I bought something and I thought it was 12 inches long and it's 24 inches long. You know what I mean? And I, it's not going to work into this bundle or something. So you just have to do your research, make sure that it's something, it's not, you don't have to launch every bundle the same day that you make it. You know Truth. what I mean? <laughs> I have, that's, I have, that's a very wise thing. I it's have a whole of about three things or four things that I'm working on. And until I find it and get all the components and get all the pictures made and all everything before that, does it get launched? And then, but it's changed. Things change, you know, when you, by the time you get them and you try to figure out how you're going to package them. And, and that's one of the things about making sure you're talking to your vendors and asking questions and understanding. I have, there was one brand that I carried for a while and they came out with a new line and I was like, there's no sizes anywhere in their catalog. I'm like, can you please send me your list that says all of the dimensions for these products? Cause I'm pretty, cause it's one of those ones that I'm like, Based on the picture, it could be 15 inches, but it could also be 20 inches. And that's a big difference when you're talking about fees on Amazon. So understanding those is important. Yeah, I have a product that has, that's a light blue. And every time I order it, it comes in a different shade. Yeah. And it's probably my number one problem that people returning it because my pictures look big blue. And when it shows up, this one is a little bit darker and this one's a little bit lighter. So we're finally ending up, we ended up getting, doing away with that one because of the fact that it's, it keeps coming different. So you have they to, couldn't be, they couldn't be consistent with it. Right. And when you get a lot of returns on that, you know, like that for the same reason you're seeing it, you know, then you know that that's not going to work. So there's, you know, so yeah, quality, I think was number one. Like I said, this year we did everything over quality you know, quality over quantity. So um, every bundle that I did was not, you know, looking at what two components go together, but I actually look at them almost as equal. Do they sell as good apart than together? You know, am I going to sell, you know, a set of cups better than one cup or am I going to sell, you know, something to that effect. So I think it's quality is what you need to look for. Yeah. Quality, quality, quality is key because I mean, nobody wants negative reviews and that's that buyer experience quality, but it, it, there's two pieces to that your buyer gets a better experience and you get a better experience because you're only bringing quality to the market. And when we spend too much time trying to create too many bundles, I I may have done this. So I'm speaking from experience. When you try and cram in too many bundles at a time, I remember one year where Kristen looked at one of my bundles, I'm like, why is this Christmas bundle not selling? She goes, cause you're missing like hate half of the important keywords to be in it. It had a red Chevy truck in it. I said nothing about said red Chevy truck, which is an iconic image. Right. And I was like, okay, that's one of those ones that I rushed through because I was trying to do too much. I was trying to do quantity over quality. It's really important to, there's nothing saying that you have to do all the, all the bundles you ever come up with or B that they all make sense. Well, you forget about them once you get them on there because they all have to go through that. To me, they have to go through that little bit of period of time for them to get. Um, so Amazon gets all your keywords and everything all together. It seems like it takes about two weeks or something before, you know, unless it's something that's just going to go right now. But I find that all of a sudden you start, you have to wait that period of time. Yep. So if you're waiting that period of time and then you're creating another one and you're creating another one, you forget about where that other one was. You know, and, and then all of a sudden it's still not selling. So, you know, you haven't tweaked it. So, yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's part of it is the importance of putting it on your calendars. Even if, if you have brought another one to market, but don't bring 15 to the market at once. It's really hard to track that many bundles happening all at once. Right. Um, and you're going to end up with a lot of mediocre and not a lot of good. If you can spend more quality time doing the research on one or two bundles, it's better than half research, half ass research. I'll actually say it half ass research on 15. And that's what people 
I've seen students do is where we do a lot because we feel like if I have more product on the shelves, I'm going to make more sales. Just because you have more product doesn't mean you're going to make more sales if it's not good quality, well written. We'll actually make better sales if you have better quality. Yeah. I mean, you'll make more sales. You Think know. of what Debbie's business has done in the past 12 months when they started focusing on quality versus quantity. Yes. With less time and increased sales. So you're, you're proof in that. Yeah, and I st I'm, I'm, I'm still working on them. And I always have something in the back of my mind where, you know, all of a sudden something will come up and I'll go, hey, that's a good key word. Or it's, you know, I didn't realize it was election time coming up or it was you know, or somebody's having, you know, doing something that's, that's patriotic or something that's, you know, that you might need to. Sometimes we see other people. Sometimes we, we're not aware of all of the things when we create the listing. And that's why being able to go back and tweak them is important. Now you've given some examples of that today. And that's very helpful because that is reminding us not to set it and forget it to continually look at what we're doing as far as listings, as far as how we're running our business. You have done amazing things in making changes to your business to make it be more of what you needed it to be, changing your listings, to, even if they're doing well, to make them sell even better. Now, going forward, you made this major change last year. What is something that you're really excited about in the next part of the year? What am I excited about? Um... What am I excited about? I don't know. <laughs> probably keep go doing what I'm doing. Um, it probably works. my brand registry. That's what I'm excited about because I haven't gotten into the the analysis of it, and I haven't gotten into some of the the other things that they're offering. And I and every day I see more and more little tweaks here and there that I didn't know that it did, and. Um, so I'm really kind of excited about that. And I do think that Amazon's paying attention more to my listings. I love the fact that I can just change a listing and go in and two minutes later, it's done. done. You, know, you don't have to worry about cases and everything else. That's been one of the hardest pieces for the listings that we did prior to brand registry, because there are still some there. And like the, the new thing that they say is, thank you for your suggestion. If we accept it, it will go live in the next 15 minutes. And so that's a new thing that I've and seen wait and wait. Yeah. And then it's waiting and waiting. And then you open a case and then they want catalogs or they want proof of whatever. And so well, it's the UPC codes. You know, I have a whole bunch that, you know, all of a sudden they change the, the picture on me and I try to go to and change the picture back or I put a better picture on it. And they're telling me that it needs to see the package with the UPC code on it. Yep. No, well, I don't, you've got it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you have my product. I don't have it here. Or, or that type of thing, you know. So, I mean, it's getting very difficult, especially with UPC codes and whether or not you need to, uh, you know, go with the exemptions or, or yeah. something. So, yep. And that's why it's important to always pay attention to what Amazon is changing and updating because it's going to change how you do things going forward. So congratulations on all the success you've been having with bundling. Thank you for spending the time with us to come on and share your story and your insights for everybody else who's trying to bundle. And I wore my mommy on. income t-shirt. Yay. Everybody. She's even got the shirt. <laughs> Love it. Mine does not look that pretty anymore. It's been worn way too much. <laughs> <laughs> I might live in my mommy income gear. It's all good. But thank you so much for sharing your time, sharing your knowledge. And if you have any questions or anything, Debbie is in the hub. She's also in the Facebook community. Um, so if you have any questions, I'm sure she'd be willing to help I you will. out. I will. So thank you so much, Debbie. Now, before, if you guys aren't a member of the Facebook community, please head over to mommyincome.com slash join us with the code word Debbie's story um, and be able to talk to Debbie and many of the other sellers that we have who have been selling on Amazon. So thank you. We'll see you again next week. Same time, same place. Have a great one, everyone. Thanks guys.